I'm Peggy Godwin. And I'm Miranda Dale. And we are both museum guides right here at the Nantucket Whaling Museum. And as such, we've always been intrigued by the rich, proud history of Nantucket empowering women. And we love to tell their stories. From the earliest settlers and their descendants on to the later arrival of people of different ethnic and racial backgrounds, Nantucket has always produced many independent, industrious women. Some of them were involved in the social movements of the day, like Lucretia Coffin Mott, who was a wonderful suffragist who was known throughout the world, but also she was a, an advocate for Native Americans and Black Americans. Others were notable in science, like the world-renowned Mariah Mitchell, who discovered a comet atop the Pacific National Bank on Main Street. But today we're going to learn about some lesser-known Nantucket's notable women, who helped raise large families, ran businesses, and helped build our diverse island community. So take a walk with us while we explore the places they lived and worked. And first, we're going to head to Center Street and learn about a very shrewd businesswoman. Right. Noted travel writer John de Crevacor said that the richest man on Nantucket owes all of his success to the ingenuity of his wife, Keziah Folger Coffin. While her husband was away at sea whaling, Keziah Folger Coffin sold household goods right here on Center Street in her store. She expanded her enterprise to buying and selling houses, opening more stores, and even lending money to those who were suffering from the war raging on the mainland. She used her connections as Benjamin Franklin's cousin to become the only representative from the colonies at the leading London trading house. Because she was a loyalist, she traded with the British for goods that were otherwise unattainable. She was put on trial for smuggling, and they even called her the pirate merchant. Thankfully, she was exonerated, and historians noted that if no one had moved more rapidly than the law, there would have been far more suffering on Nantucket. And the trend of Nantucket businesswomen continued well after the decline of whaling, when many of the retail-owned shops were owned by female proprietors right here on Center Street. But it was after the Civil War when it was called Petticoat Row. Now we'll go to the home of whaling merchant Gideon Folger and learn about his amazing daughter. Okay, Lydia Folger Fowler was a sixth generation Nantucketer, descending from one of the original settlers here and she was also a pioneering American physician. She grew up right here at 15 Gardner Street. She was educated on the island, and then she went on to Wheaton Seminary to earn her medical degree. She was the second woman in the United States to earn a medical degree and the first American-born woman to do so. She lectured throughout the country on physiology, anatomy, hygiene, and she specialized in the care of women and children. In her later years, she moved to the London slums and took care of the poor and needy. And very unfortunately, at that time, she contracted blood poisoning and died at the young age of 56. But she probably touched more lives than any other American woman physician of her time and opened the medical profession to women. She's been overlooked by history, so I think we can all try to remember Lydia Folger Fowler. Now we're gonna head on to Ferris Street and learn about a woman who revolutionized the retail industry. Here we are at the corner of Main and Ferris Street in this beautiful park, a great place to talk about our next Nantucket woman, Margaret Getchell. Let's have a seat. Margaret Getchell grew up on Nantucket and was educated right up here on Ferris Street. And she first became a teacher, but after a while she decided to spread her wings a little bit and she moved to New York City to work in a small dry goods store called Macy's. The store was owned by her distant cousin, Roland Huzzy Macy. And she had a real flair for merchandising. She was great with numbers and she knew how to do window displays. She was so good that within four years, the store had tripled in size and she became the first female executive in New York City. She had a lot of merchandising ideas, and one of them was to establish a soda fountain right in the middle of the store so that thirsty customers would have to walk by all this very enticing merchandise to get their refreshments. Another idea that she had concerned Roland Hussey Macy, who had gone on a whaling voyage when he was a very young man. He really didn't like whaling very much, but on that particular voyage, he got a red star tattooed on the back of his hand. Well, Margaret convinced him to use that as his logo. And even today, you will see packages with a red star logo or advertising for Macy's. She 
her, she had a motto, and her motto was, be everywhere, do everything, and never fail to astonish the customer. And now let's go up to the Quaker Meeting House and talk about the woman who started the Society of Friends on Nantucket. Mary Coffin Starbuck, or Great Mary, was the daughter of Tristram Coffin, one of the first English settlers on the island. She and her husband, Nathaniel Starbuck, opened a trading post that served the Wampanoags and the English settlers. She was educated, could read and write, and handled the business of accounts. She was a woman of power and influence, and even the spokesperson for her family at town meeting. At, in 1702, Mary hosted John Richardson, a Quaker minister who is impassioned, and he spoke to a large audience at her home. His words inspired Mary and her family to convert to Quakerism and become some of the first members of the Society of Friends on Nantucket. And Mary became a very respected elder in this community. It was so extraordinary that Mary's conversion to Quakerism influenced so many Nantucketers to follow her lead and convert. By the 1740s, Quakerism was the dominant religion on the island, and it remained so for almost a century. And Mary kept very careful watch on the faith and even held meetings in her home. Although highly conservative, Quakerism's emphasis on education for both men and women and female leadership within the church inspired many Nantucket Quaker women to flourish. So let's go from one house of worship to another, the Unitarian Church, and learn about the first female minister in New England. Phoebe Ann Coffin Hannaford, our next woman, don't like the other women we've talked about, grew up right here on Nantucket and became a teacher, but she was also a writer and a contributor to the local newspaper. She loved to write, so she wrote a lot of poetry. She wrote a book on anti-slavery, and she also published several biographies, which were very well received. In 1868, she accepted the call to the First Universalist Church to become the first woman minister in New England. She was also the first female chaplain to the Connecticut legislature. She was a suffragist, nationally known. She was also an active member of many women's reform groups right here on the island, and a member of the philosophical, literary, and scientific societies. She had a great love for Nantucket, and she wrote to the Nantucket newspaper and said, that I have been a successful preacher is largely due to the fact of my Quaker upbringing on Nantucket where women preach and men are useful on washing days and neither feel themselves out of place. This is Stone Alley. It leads from Orange Street down to Union Street and it's where we'll meet another Nantucket notable businesswoman. Perhaps born into slavery, Mary Ellen Pleasant came to Nantucket in 1820 as a domestic servant, possibly indentured. She met Mary Hussey, who was known as Grandma Hussey on Nantucket and worked in her shop, and she showed personal magnetism and business skills. And she became a lifelong member of the family of Phoebe Hussey Gardner, who was the granddaughter of Mary Hussey. And the Gardners were very active in the abolitionist anti-slavery movement, and Mary Ellen met many famous abolitionists. In 1840, she headed west to California during the gold rush and worked on the Underground Railroad, and she even ran an exclusive gentleman's club and identified herself as a capitalist by profession. She successfully attacked racial discrimination in San Francisco transportation system when she and another woman were ejected from a streetcar, and she's known as the mother of civil rights in California. Here we are at the west end of town. It was a neighborhood once known as New Guinea. And this is where many of Nantucket's black and African residents built their homes during the days of whaling. And it's later where the Cape Verdean and Azorean community was centered. And we're going to be talking about Anna Gardner. And we're standing in front of the African Meeting House, a perfect place to introduce you to Anna. When Anna was six years old, she had grown up in a Quaker abolitionist family and something happened that influenced her life. Her parents gave shelter to an escaped slave named Arthur Cooper and his family and who were being hunted by slave traders and this really inspired her lifelong commitment to fighting slavery and segregation and fighting for educational reform. She was a teacher right here at the African Meeting House, a one-room schoolhouse. She had 50 students and she taught all grades up to the ninth grade. 
And Anna was at the heart of the segregation issue when the Nantucket schools were still segregated. One of her pupils, Eunice Ross, applied to go to the high school, but she was refused admission because of her color. And Anna resigned her position here at the, in the school, not just in protest, but also to devote her life to equal education for blacks. After leaving the African school, she often would, would be seen wearing a heart-shaped pin, which was given to her by her grateful students at the school. Anna was also involved in the Nantucket Anti-Slavery Society. And as such, she was instrumental in bringing several important speakers to Nantucket, including Frederick Douglass and William Lloyd Garrison. Perhaps her greatest contribution came when, toward the end of the Civil War, she went down south and opened up schools for those people who were newly freed from slavery. And next, we're going to go right next door to talk about a prominent black landowner and property owner. Originally from Virginia, Florence Higginbotham worked in Boston and trained at the Boston Cooking School. She came to Nantucket in 1911, where she met a widow named Evelyn Underhill, who owned the popular Underhill Cottages in Sconset. And Underhill hired Higginbotham to manage the properties. And by 1920, Florence had saved enough money to purchase 27 York Street as an investment. And this was a home that was once owned by a formerly enslaved man named Seneca Boston. And she named the home Mizpah, which means watchtower. And when Evelyn Underhill lost her investments in the stock market crash, Florence graciously invited her into her home, where they listened to jazz and they socialized. But due to the racial insensitivities of the day, when Evelyn had guests over, Florence would treat to the back quarters of her home. In 1933, Florence purchased the home next door, which is the African Meeting House, and she rented it to artists as studio space. She was an inspiration to all Nantucket women who wanted to own and manage their own properties. And today, both of these homes are owned by the Museum of African American History, and they went under a complete award-winning restoration. Many Cape Verdeans emigrated to Nantucket in the 20th century, searching for better lives drawn into work in the cranberry bogs. And they built their homes in the vicinity of Five Corners near the waterfront. They rooted themselves into the Nantucket community, sharing a rich heritage of faith, music, culinary traditions. They were an industrious and hardworking group and contributed to healthcare and business and service. Service to others was essential in all that they did. A pillar in this community, Edith Correa Perry, came to Nantucket as an infant. She worked in the Roberts House, St. Mary's Church, and her dedication to caregiving led her to work at Our Island Home for many, many years. She and her husband purchased a 33-acre farm outside of town, and they were known for establishing a nightclub called 30 Acres that was the happening place for many, many years. And at the time of her death, Edith was survived by 12 children, 47 grandchildren, and three great-grandchildren. And three of her grandchildren are pictured here, posed in front of the old mill for a 1970 National Geographic photo. At the 1990 Correa Family Thanksgiving reunion at the Knights of Columbus Hall, up to 200 family members from New Bedford, Nantucket, and afar gathered. And Edith was at the top of the family tree. She sat stationed at the head of the table while all her family brought food, and she and her siblings joked about their personalities and reminisced about the celebrations they had shared. She is known for her warm and cheerful demeanor and her delicious pear tree jellies, which she shared with all of her friends and family. And she is known as a caring mother figure for all. Next we'll meet a prominent and beloved Islander who also lived in this New Guinea community. And that is Lucinda Cooper, who led an amazing life. She was born in Africa. She was caught by slave traders when she was just a teenager. She lived on two continents and she survived three wars. She survived the Revolutionary War, the War of 1812, and the Civil War. Aunt Lucy, as she was called in the neighborhood, was married to Arthur Cooper. She was his second wife, and Arthur Cooper was the leader of the black community. And he's the man that we talked about earlier at the African Meeting House. And she and Arthur were members of the Zion Church right here in this neighborhood. And in 1833, they purchased a home on Angola Street, 
Unfortunately, the home no longer stands, but on an 1858 map, you can see exactly where their home was. The children of the neighborhood and all of Nantucket were really very enthralled by Lucinda Cooper, or Aunt Lucy, as they called her. She outlived her husband by many, many years, and when she died, Nantucketers said that she was 110 years old. Now, two of her biggest fans were two young women who lived on, white women, white young women who lived on Pleasant Street. And they were so fond of Aunt Lucy that when she died, they wanted to be sure that she had a marker on her gravestone. So they went around the neighborhood soliciting funds for this marker. Unfortunately, they met with some racism because not everyone was willing to contribute. However, they did raise $18 and that was enough for the marker for Lucinda Cooper's grave. Our last stop will be Prospect Hill Cemetery to meet a prominent member of the 20th century Wampanoag community. When the English settlers arrived on Nantucket in 1659, there were approximately 2,000 Wampanoags living on Nantucket. And the English coexisted and traded with these people, but they gradually purchased and took over their land. Some Wampanoags worked with the English, but many left for the mainland. And there was an epidemic that hit in the mid-1700s and killed hundreds of Wampanoags, leaving an only a small remainder of the population. But Nantucket's Native American legacy lives on through interracial marriages and Nantucket Wampanoags who joined other communities on Martha's Vineyard and the mainland. In the 1800s, the West family came to Nantucket and Ruth West Coombs was a descendant of the Chappaquiddick and Aquina community of Martha's Vineyard. She married Darius Coombs, who was a Mashpee Wampanoag. And Ruth was an educator. Her presentations raised awareness and appreciation for the Wampanoag culture. She toured New England, singing other, under her native title, Princess Red Feather. And she wore her traditional Wampanoag clothing, which had deep meaning of who she was. And she liked to exercise her creative flair on the costume team for theater workshop. And the Inquirer Mirror said that her outfits were outstanding in their flamboyance. And Ruth is buried here at the Coombs family plot in Prospect Hill Cemetery. And it's said today that there are 15,000 Wampanoags that live nationwide. So we're coming to the end of our tour and we've touched on just a few of Nantucket's notable women. And today women continue to inspire us in leadership roles, government officials, nonprofit directors, and other community leaders in all sorts of endeavors. So thank you for joining us and come visit us at the Whaling Museum and our historic properties where you can continue to learn about Nantucket's notable women and their stories.